The Abruzzi class. The Abruzzi class. Named, without a doubt, for the wrong member of the class. We'll leave that to one side. The Abruzzi class are the last, best, and probably only example of the Condottori's that I would actually go to war in. In fact, they are possibly the only Italian cruisers I would actually be happy, not content, but happy to be assigned to in a war zone in World War II. They are arguably some of the best light cruisers produced in World War II. But this whole week I have been thinking about the way people learn. Now, this sounds like a strange thing for discussing when you're talking about warships. But you have to remember the Condottori's are a product of the learning the Regia Marina went through during the First World War. They are a product of the Adriatic. I've recorded three versions of this video before I recorded this one. So this is the fourth. It's being recorded at 9 o'clock at night and it was supposed to go live at 7. So I doubt this will go live before the 12th. And I'm apologizing now for it being late, but it is late because of the way I learn. I am an auditory and kinetic learner. I love to read. I am a voracious reader and I read like anything. And I learn from reading. But I only really learn it, as in really acknowledge my thinking about it, when I start trying to teach it. And I'm moving around in front of a class, or even now with my hands going and everything in front of me moving while I'm talking and talking to camera. This means that I will often write a speech, and I will start off giving that speech, and I will change it halfway through. I will change it sometimes from the get-go. It really annoys people who want to do things like check your speeches before you do them. Someone who does improvisation like that is an absolute nightmare for anyone who wants to do media relations. And leaving that to one side, it does mean I have the skill of walking and talking, which, disturbing enough, is actually a skill. I always thought it was standard human nature, but apparently it's a skill to do it on camera. And this is the point at which people usually start looking at me and going, well, how do you learn like that? What are you sort of learning in that sort of way? I'm a kinetic learner. I, I like to be doing something while I'm learning. It's one of the other tricks I do is I read through books, record myself reading them, and then stick them on tapes. Well, it used to be tapes, of course, when I was younger. Now it's just MP3 files on my phone and listen to them in my ears while I'm in the gym. Tends to go section of book, music, section of book, music, depending on what I'm doing. I'm listening to myself talk while I'm trying to run on the treadmill is not a good day for anyone within hearing range. But it works while I'm doing weights. Now, there is something you have to acknowledge when you talk about learning. Sometimes, no matter how much and how well you learn, you can still end up getting covered with glitter. One of my favourite scenes from The Rookie. If you haven't seen it, it's a great comedy. I don't think it's supposed to be a comedy, but I find it funny. Anyway, the point is, the Rage and Marina come out of World War I, and they start developing the Condottori's. And they start developing the various cruisers and working out the navy they're going to be. And the navy they're going to be is in many ways designed to fight the Adriatic again. The Adriatic as in the World War I scenario of the Adriatic again. Not necessarily the World War II Adriatic. And this is the cornerstone of the Mare Nostrum philosophy because... And one of the reasons why the British loved to send submarines, cruisers, destroyers, anything they could into the Adriatic. Going through the Straits of Otranto was great. It wound up the Italians something chronic. It was like 
doing Toronto all over again, or anything else, or, the, you know, the Battle of Cape Matapan. All of these battles, they tend to buy six or so months with an action of the Italians not really doing as much as they could do. Going to straight to Toronto, just one instant, would buy you at least six or so weeks of it. In fact, you can almost argue, to an extent, which is more devastating to the Italian Navy, the physical attack of Taranto or the psychological attack of that force going into the Straits of Taranto as part of the operation. And attacking the Italian convoy out from the Adriatic. It's like they're nightmares and all their self-beliefs rolled into one. There are navies which are book navies, which have learned and developed themselves from books. We can think of them. There are some very large navies in this world which are book navies. We think most of the Chinese navy is a book navy. The modern Chinese navy is a book navy. They haven't fought a naval battle in a very long time. They had some issues with Vietnam, etc. at certain points, but those didn't really flare up to the extent of a major naval involvement. In fact, if we think about it honestly, all modern navies really are book navies. There is no navy which has been built based on recent war experience. The Royal Navy could sort of claim that for about 1982 to 2002. They could say 20 years. But now, Falklands War is further from us now than the Falklands War was from World War II. And no one was, a, no one was claiming that the Royal Navy of the Falklands War was designed with war experience in mind. You can see that from the way the ships are orientated. The further you get away from conflict, the easier it is for theory to dominate and for people to go down loopholes and rabbit holes and all sorts of wonderful, wonderful cult sets. You can end up on all of them. However, that doesn't mean being close to war actually helps you. Because you can also be too close to war. And this is the trouble for the Regia Marina. They are too close. They are trying to refight the battles of World War I that they fought. The experience of World War I that they had. Rather than think about, hang on, what can we learn from these lessons? In World War I, you can dictate a battle with speed. In World War I, you can dictate the engagement range with speed. And that's what matters. It isn't a panacea. <laughs> Certainly not. Please note, there are battles which are won thanks to them dictating the range of speed, but which still would probably have got turned out that result even if they hadn't had the speed advantage. Coronel is a good example. The British ships, one of those cruisers was just not designed to match up at long range, or even really at medium range. It was a short range engagement vessel. Its weapons were not suited to the world it had come into. It was a pre-Dreadnought era vessel, which was still in service. Or rather, a pre-Dreadnought mindset era vessel. And that is something far scarier to think about. Because if we think about that, what is your Dreadnought moment? What is a modern Dreadnought moment? We won't know, probably. When Dreadnought was launched, the world knew there was a Dreadnought moment. But when HMS Afridi was launched, did anyone look around and go, there's a tribal destroyer moment? No. I would argue the tribal destroyers 
are probably the most balanced general purpose destroyer design of the large fleet destroyers built prior to World War II. But very quickly, other navies start moving to that model once World War II comes along. But we still do not call all the destroyers since tribal destroyers. This means that there can be changes that we just don't see happening until a war shows whether they were valid or not. There are also ships and ideas launched in the 1930s, which we very quickly forget. The Condottori's are often written off as this. But the Abruzzi class, these vessels which have just slightly less speed than their siblings, and just that much more armour and that much greater capability, they're put to one side. The lessons of them, the fact that they last so long in service that they form the cornerstone of the Marina Nacional for quite such a long time after World War II, is almost forgotten. One of the interesting conversations I've had in the last week was someone honestly turning around to me and saying, but why would we study cruisers? We don't build them anymore. But you still build ships for those roles. You don't call those ships cruisers anymore because no one builds a cruiser. And the odds are, at some point, people will stop building destroyers because they will be too big and expensive, and so people will be going for a frigate navy until the frigates grow too big and expensive. And then they'll be building... Goodness knows what. Oceanic combat vessels, probably. Um, it'll be something. It will be something. And that worries me. Because there is another form of learning. It's called selective learning. And it's something which people often do when they want to just pass a test. It's not good learning for life. And everyone agrees that learning just by rote to pass a test doesn't really equip you with the knowledge and skills you need for life. There are a few very, very small minority of lucky people who can do that with not such knowledge, and then can apply it in real life, and can get through. But those are such a rarity and a minority that they are not just the exception, they are the unicorns. The reality is that most of us need to have an understanding as well as a learning in order to apply knowledge to life, in order to not just past test and this is where these ships really come in and the italian cruisers as a whole come in these ships have lessons which do not involve passing a test but do involve building ships for the modern world and building ships for the period they are sleek well designed I have to say I'm not the biggest fan of the mast arrangement on the forward superstructure, but leaving that to one side, there is a pragmatic and practical reason for the rangefinder being positioned so and for it operating in such a way. There is a practical and pragmatic reason for the shape of the ships. And they are a well-balanced design. Yes, they have torpedo center line. Yes. They have these dual-purpose 100mm guns positioned to provide good coverage and good heavy AA. Yes, they have five forward, five aft, six-inch guns with good, clear fields of fire. They are capable, well-designed ships. Can they go 37 knots? No. They can go 34 knots. They're still overweight. They're 11,500 tons in standard. So they're overweight. But still, they are good ships. 
These are their stats. 11,350 tons in standard, 11,735 tons for load. Now, I have to say, I find the stats, and these are mostly quoted in most of the books, don't quite add up to me. I'm sure they're correct, because I trust the authors to have done good and thorough research. But when I'm looking at something like this, and I'm going, you're going to do a range of 4,125 nautical miles at 13 knots. Well, standard to full is supposed to be, full is everything on board. Standard is everything minus the weight of fuel and water. Fuel and water. So, 385 tons of fuel and water will get her 4,125 nautical miles at 13 knots. Those are very efficient engines. It's not impossible. But either the range is off, or the full load is off. I'm not sure which one. But perhaps they all got their information from the same source and it was just wrong. I don't know. I haven't been able to go and find much of the Italian source. This is why I had back at this point these two books. They're very well written. They're, of course, in English. And I have to say, I really have a soft spot for this one. It's a very enjoyable book to read. It really is. But the thing is, it is not on light cruisers. It's the heavy cruiser book. And the Abruzzis are the most advanced of the light cruisers, of the Conditori. As you can see, they have a two-layered armor system. They lose their torpedoes later in the war, and they gain anti-submarine mortars. Uh, they have four twin 100mm guns, eight 37mm guns, which, again, is a fine weapon. Okay, yes, it's no 40mm pom-pom or even 40mm bofors. Nowhere near either of those. But it's a fine weapon for the 37mm, and for the Italians, we certainly have felt it very useful for the Mediterranean. I... There are not 100% weapons. All the weapons available have trade-offs. And I think the 37mm probably has more trade-offs than necessarily the Italians would like, but that still doesn't make it a bad weapon. It just makes it not as good as some of the others on paper. Still wasn't fun to do an air attack against. The outer belt, 30mm. The inner belt, 100mm. This sort of armour arrangement. The whole armour scheme of some of the earlier Condottoris was less than the outer belt. These ships are very well designed. They are designed to have armour on the outside enough to trigger a shell, to decap it, or a, or a bomb and then have enough armour inside to maintain structural integrity and to maintain a buoyancy factor. So it stays afloat. And they do that well. Now Luigi di Sava Duca della Abruzzi is a good looking ship. Lay down on 28th of December 1933, launched 21st of April 1936, Commissioned on the 1st of December 1937, decommissioned January 1961. She was refitted quite heavily in 1953 and was part of the uh, handover of Trieste to Italy. She was a key part of strengthening the Italian position at the bargaining table. She fought during World War II at the Battle of Calibria, where she led a squadron of light cruisers. They fired the first salvos of the battle. She was part of the fleet that attempted to intercept the convoy hats. Uh, part of the ca a Cape Battle of Cape Matapan. She was part of convoy uh, of the force which tried to intercept Halberd. She was part of a lot of operations. She was actually damaged by a torpedo on the 24th of no uh, 22nd of November, 1941, but repaired and was interned by the Allies after the armistice. 
and then served in the South Atlantic with the Italian co-belligerent navy. That's when the Royal Navy and the US Navy decided, let's use the Italian Navy to go and hunt in the South Atlantic, because these ships are really well designed for the South Atlantic. Um, it keeps them nice and far out the way and actually makes them useful and allows us to use our ships for doing actual war fighting. <sighs> it works. Luigi Amido, uh, Amido Duke of Abruzzi. I have all sorts of things I can say about him, but let's just list off. Arctic Explorer certainly spends more time doing that than he does with the Navy. Italian Naval Sea and Sea, World War I. The French and the British begged the Italians, pretty much did everything apart from write the changing orders themselves to get rid of him. The Italians resorted to the traditional way of getting someone of senior nobility and political connections rid of, promoting him from Vice Admiral to Admiral, and uh, therefore not giving him post after that. It's the Peter Principle at work. Uh, delivered a tank to Ethiopia, which was a key part of stopping a what could have been a disadvantageous and please note I'm using these words carefully, a disadvantageous for Italy coup d'etat in Ethiopia in 1928, and founded a village which is now modern Yoa in Somalia. He also spent way too much time supporting Mussolini. But he's a symptom of nationalism gone bad, which is also what is the case of all these names. The Italians had unified less than a hundred years before. They were still searching for a national identity as a nation rather than as regions and collection of nations. They're still building that. World War I had helped but it hadn't really helped in the, in the way it was supposed to. It hadn't unified the country. It had in many ways hardened some of the divisions. He was fiercely proud of his nation and prepared to do anything to make it grander and greater and more powerful and more splendiferous. The trouble was, he looked for that greatness, for that splendiferousness externally. And again, learning. Before you can learn lessons from outside of you, you need to reflect on the lessons from inside of you. This isn't just something I'm randomly saying. One of the things I teach is reflective writing. Why do I teach reflective writing at university? Well, it helps to take a look at yourself regularly. As a person, as a company, as a nation, as a group of any kind, it helps to take a look at yourself. Clearly identify what your strengths and weaknesses are, how you can ameliorate your weaknesses, how you can build upon your strengths, how you can grow yourself. The easy answer is to blame someone else. The easy answer is to go searching for that outside of you. We can talk about the Condottori's as being, especially the first generation. The Italians looking at what their great successes were and going, we will build to carry out these even more successfully. Not, we will learn from these what needs to be done and adapt it and look internally. No, we will just build these because that's the simple answer. And in this case, the Duke of Abruzzi the simple answer was to go abroad, to search for Italian greatness abroad, rather than building at home first. They missed out the lesson of the Roman Empire, which was, you first build Rome, then you build an empire, not the other way around. Operation Halberd is a good example of the Italians actually putting into some practice some of the learning they had done. Their organization, their deliverance of force. The whole point about a central Mediterranean strategy, about the damage they could do to the British, especially after the French were no longer part of the war, 
was to make it difficult for goods to move east to west. I've often talked about the importance of the Italian Navy, the Regium Marina, in World War II. They have far more military capability than the Kriegsmarine do. They are far more capable than they are, especially at the beginning. But also, they are in a far more strategically difficult position for the Royal Navy to deal with. Kriegsmarine, you can blockade. Yes, their submarines are going to go out into the Atlantic, but that's a one-dimensional threat. The Italians are throwing submarines, battleships, and cruisers at you, and they're throwing them at you in numbers, and they're fast, and you're in narrow waters where you don't have much room for manoeuvre. This is the scenario you're in. The Mediterranean is the Adriatic writ large in this scenario. There's not enough room for manoeuvre, there's not enough room to hide, there's not enough room to faint. You have to go... Full on. Yes, the British do confusing things. They have battleships go reverse course through the Straits of Gibraltar. They ha keep the ta Force H away from the convoy so that the Italians will be drawn into Force H, not the convoy, for the first couple of days. They do everything they can. And they have to do that because of the threat the Italians have managed to build up. And the Abruzzis and the Condottori are part of this. Because their speed is a problem. The problem for them, though, is that there is this in the middle of the task force. HMS Ark Royal. And the problem for them is that the speed of the aircraft aboard her, even the swordfish, outstrip all of their cruisers. If you can be the fastest, wonderful. But if you can't be the fastest, don't try and compete on it. Work out how fast you need to be. That's the lesson. Because if they looked at the World War I, they looked at the experience of the Adriatic, they'd have realised that even though they were often the fastest, that didn't necessarily mean victory. Whilst it could give you control of a fight, it didn't guarantee control of the fight. Being faster was an advantage. Being fastest didn't necessarily carry it. Giuseppe Garibaldi. You couldn't have a better person to try and form an Italian nationalism, a national identity around. There's several problems with him for that. I'm not claiming he's always a nice person. In fact, honestly, I half expected when Charles Dance was asked who he was modelling to and Lannister on to go, I modelled him when I was portraying him on Giuseppe Garibaldi, who always had an answer, who always seemed to be able to answer, send organised troops and was always able to lead. Admittedly, he doesn't do some of the nasty stuff which... Two and Lannister does, but there is a certain thing of having a wise leadership figure going on here. And there's also the fact that Garibaldi's red shirts were key. A model of thing that the black shirts of the Nazis and the brown shirts and all these groups were modelled on because of the image of the red shirts. Garibaldi itself goes on to be a reconstructed as a guided missile cruiser and one of the most powerful cruisers in the NATO forces for many years. During World War II, she took part in the Battle of Calabria. She was part of key to attacking HMS Neptune during that battle. She took part in the operations, well, the sorties against MB5. And she was anchored at Taranto when the British attacked the fleet, Italian fleet in harbour. She took part in the Battle of Cape Matapan. She was torpedoed and damaged by HMS Upholder. She failed to intercept, Hubble Force failed to intercept, the Tiger Convoy. She took part in the force again, in Operation V5 and M43, or escorting Axis convoys. She took part in the operations against Vigorous, which were even more successful than those against Halber. They actually did manage to disrupt, and the Battle of Cert, the Second Battle of Cert, almost goes very badly wrong for the Royal Navy, largely because the Italians, the Regia Marina, were able to put significant cruisers 
very fast cruisers exactly where they didn't want them to be. And they drew the British cruisers off. And if it hadn't been for the Royal Navy's destroyers going pretty much suicidal against a certain Italian battleship, there could have been a convoy sunk. And that would definitely change some of the narrative of World War II. She also joined her sister in the South Atlantic after the uh, Italians decided to switch sides. Giuseppe Garibaldi. You can have a better example of a figure for a conduttore to be named after. Basically, World War I generals and admirals should be scrapped their names completely. There's not a single one who actually is probably deserving of it. But leaders like him, he's up there. He led liberation movements on two continents. At one point, he was the dictator of Sicily and the Minister of War for the Roman Republic, and that's a cool title to have. Minister of War for Rome? Come on. We'd all like that title for at least five minutes. He's also probably one of the finest dead generals ever. It's quite disturbing, considering that he lives... Well, he lives from 1807 to 1882. And his commands, Hunters of the Alps, International Legion, Army of the Vosgers, took part in the Ragamuffin War, the Uruguayan Civil War, the Italian Unification Wars, the Franco-Prussian War. He's good. He served from 1835 to 1871. 1835 to 1871. And he formed most of his armies himself. I'm not saying he was universally nice. He wasn't. He was a very good general. And sometimes that means you have to be nasty. But you can certainly never question whether he lived and thought his beliefs. I would also add, though, that they gave the motto of Obedisco, I obey, to the ship. This is a man who obeyed when he believed it was the right thing to do. When it wasn't, he exercised his wiser judgment and reinterpreted those orders with the latitude that a general can exercise. Thoroughly. Operation Vigorous, as I already mentioned, was not a good operation for the Royal Navy. It really wasn't. It's known as the Battle of Mid-June, 1942. And it's just terrible. It's a part of Operation Julius, which is simultaneous with Operation Harpoon. And the whole idea was to get ships through to Gibraltar. Philip Vian has a force of eight light cruisers, 26 destroyers, nine submarines, two minesweepers, four corvettes, two rescue ships, four motor torpedo boats, 11 merchant ships, and an auxiliary ship. And that's not enough. Because he's taking on two battleships, two heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, wonder which ones, 12 destroyers, six E-boats, two U-boats, and roughly 220 aircraft. He loses a light cruiser, three destroyers, two merchant ships, and a motor torpedo boat sunk. Three cruisers, two merchant ships damaged, 200 killed. The Italians have a heavy cruiser sunk, a battleship damaged, 21 aircraft shot down, and roughly 600 killed. Which makes it sound like, oh, shouldn't that be an Allied victory? No, it's an Axis victory. Because the Allies failed to achieve their aim. The Axis stopped the convoy going through.
Cruisers are not an easy thing to build. They're not an easy thing to get right. They require learning. But so do all the ships. These vessels are not their World War II versions. These are the modified ones they are post-World War II. In the age of the missiles. When the gun has been su succeeded. But, remember the lesson of the Falklands War? The lesson that still keeps getting forgotten? That the gun was still useful? Why? Because pound for pound, it was a very economic way of delivering firepower exactly where you needed it. You could carry a lot more shells than you could missiles. You could provide a lot more support than you could missiles. Guns are something which are forgotten a lot in the conversation we have today. And that's to an extent a product of our learning. When you're looking for something cool in terms of artillery, high Mars springs to mind. Those long range rockets. Or people start talking about Talans and the various land. Uh, there's a cruise missiles and the damage they can do. Or people talk about ballistic missiles. You talk about the biggest, powerful, meanest weapon you can see. In the 1920s and 30s, the biggest, powerful, meanest weapon you can see was the battleship. It was. But it was the cruisers which did the most work. Even then, and in World War II, certainly the cruisers did the most work. They'd done the most work in World War I. You see, the popular narrative, the popular learning, can be wrong as well as right. One of the key things you teach when you start to teach reflective writing and reflective thinking and how to do uh, be reflective is to evaluate yourself. Know your strengths, know your weaknesses. So you can evaluate your decisions to check your own logic. To mark your own homework, in a way. This means you have the capacity to know when you are right and when you are wrong. But that means you also get to turn around and think, well, hang on, if everyone's telling me I'm wrong... I've analysed myself. I don't think I'm wrong. Now, it could be that everyone else doesn't have the same data you have. That is a very valid conclusion. More often than not, when you have differences of opinion, of opinion, you're actually dealing with differences of data. Some people can have too much data. They can have so much data they can't really see what a decision is. And some people can have too little. Some people's data can all be skewed from one perspective. Which is another reason why you try and teach students, especially at university, to be balanced in their approach. If you're going to read, let's say, you read a paper, you read The Guardian on a regular basis. It's a very well-informed paper, but it does have a bias. It admits it has a bias. There is nothing wrong with that. Everyone has a bias. Be admitting it. So you can flip it around and go, well, I also read The Telegraph. Because the reality is probably going to be somewhere between the two. Because both are not going to focus in on the information that suits their bias. And when you put all that information together, you might have a perspective. When we're dealing with the Italian cruisers and their legacy of World War II, often they are forgotten because the Regia Marina is forgotten. Because, in many ways, we want to forget the Italian involvement because we like the Italian people. And it's, to an extent, a larger symptom of what happened with Germany post-war. It was all Mussolini. And because it was all Mussolini... 
And then you have the fact that the Americans weren't really involved in the Mediterranean conflict. And the battles were all long, multi-running, multi-day affairs, which weren't really that big, decisive, climactic moments. So no one really wants to make a movie about them. You know, you the Battle of the River Plate is great. That has a wonderful, decisive, climactic moment where a grass bay blows itself up. Trying doing a video about a movie about the Battle of Cape Manapan? Well, that's three battleships and a carrier pummeling two cruisers in the middle of the night before they can even fire back. That's not really a decisive, you know, feel-good moment. That looks like murder. Admittedly, that is the product of a very long, very complicated, very drawn-out process to get to there. And frankly, good combat can look a lot like that. Can look a lot like that. Because if you ask Admiral Cunningham to pick, Sir, do you want to fight the enemy fair so they can fire back at you? Or would you like to make sure that the enemy are lose their ships and you don't lose any crew? He would look at you as if you were absolutely insane even asking the question. Of course he doesn't want to fight fair. Then he has to write the letters home to the people about to get killed. Because if you're fighting a battle fair, that means people get killed on both sides. And you can't afford to lose people. You don't want people to die on your side. War isn't like that. Life isn't like that. Italian cruisers in World War II give us these lessons. The Condottori's seem to show us speed is not the thing you build your ships for. Because if you build your ships just for speed, then they cannot do the other things they need to do. But the Abruzzi's, where they go, hang on, let's scale down the speed. Because if you take off those three knots, you can save a lot of weight in machinery. And we sort of completely ignore the tonnage rate, uh, the treaty tonnage limitations entirely. We can actually build a very good, very fast, very powerful cruiser. It's not as fast, but it's fast enough. It's not as powerful as we could possibly build a heavy cruiser. But with its 10 6-inch guns, it's going to match in. To outgun it, the British have to turn up with a town-class cruiser. Because let's be honest, Ajax... Achilles, all the Leanders, nope. In fact, the Abruzzi's could probably take pretty much every light cruiser short of a town-class cruiser. Crown colonies, they give them a trouble. But not as much trouble. Brooklyn's? Well, the Brooklyn's have more firepower. They certainly do. But the Brooklyn's have a problem. They have a lot less armor. So they have to be lucky in their first rounds. Because if they don't get that first salvo whack, it's the Abruzzi's are going to win this one. And I love the Brooklyn's. So, I always finish these videos off with a question. And I'm not going to not include a question this time. I'm not going to make it personal. I'm not going to ask people to do a reflective comment on themselves, on their strengths and weaknesses. That's uh, what I sent my students. <laughs> they hate me for it. They thank me for it afterwards, about two and a half, three years later. But they hate me for it when I do. I said it first. I know what they do. I'm honest enough for myself to admit that no one, no one wants to write about themselves. No one wants to write a critical analysis of themselves and do reflective writing. It's painful. Especially when you come into university and you're going, well, I'm not doing psychology. Why do I have to do this? Because it's part of the learning process. It's about understanding yourself because you can only start learning about our things and learning how you best learn things when you're honest with yourself. No, what I want to ask as a question for all of you to think about is this. 
pick any navy of any period and write what should have been its reflective paper. What it thinks its five strengths, uh, greatest strengths are and its five greatest weaknesses are and how it can adjust them. The reason I'm going to ask these comments is because I'm thinking of a series during the te year of technology, which is sort of like this, and that I'm going to pick a navy and a period every month. It's going to be a different one. So I'm going to do 12 of them, well, 11, through the year. Because as you can see on this, there are various subjects each week in recorded videos. This is not the last of the Italian cruisers. That's the Capitani Romani class. But they are a different vessel again from the Condottori, so they're going to be a completely different sort of style discussion. Which is why I included this in the Abruzzi's, because they are the end of the Condottori's. They are the end of the Regia Marina's real light cruisers of World War I Adriatic knowledge flow. So, I look forward to the Navy's reflective comments, because I know one thing I do know, and I'm proud of it and incredibly excited by it, is the fact that as well as having wonderful patrons, wonderful subscribers, all those people who chat in videos, and everyone, the viewers, everything who make this YouTube channel so special to me to do as a way of teaching more naval history and sharing my love, is that along with that, there's a lot of you who actually like those questions. I guess this, get that from the fact the number of people who comment whenever I don't put in a question. And I think this one, reflective writing on a navy from any period you want, any navy you want, but it's only one navy in that period, any period, I can just imagine what you all do with it. we got some fun coming up. Battle Navarino coming up. Mm-hmm. That's going to be cool. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you as ever for your support, and take care.